Give me Bible radio. Hebrews chapter 8. How many are excited about God's word? I know when I got when I first got saved, man, I wanted to learn the Bible so much. I didn't care what had to change. I'll read the Bible and whenever I when I was I just wanted to learn more about God, more about the Bible. And the more I learned, things started to happen where I had to say, "You know what? I just learned about the truth about the Bible." Y'all know what I'm talking about? The truth will make you not be able to sing certain songs no more. Amen. Not just the songs of the world, but sometimes songs that are in the church. Amen. You know that song, like, We Come This Far By Faith? Leaning on the Lord? Trusting in His Holy Word? Yes. That song also says, He never failed me yet. But you know what? I can't say that no more. I can't say He never failed me yet. Amen. You know why? Because He'll never fail me. I say, He never failed me, no. no he never because God can't fail. Amen. People blame God too much and become atheists because they blame everything on God. Things that they don't understand. God is holy. God is perfect. God makes no mistakes. Even when you think that God is not being so nice to you, God is being nice to you. Amen. God will make your path crooked so He can get you right. Some people want so much to do in this life and has nothing, their plans have nothing to do with God. And then you wonder why things happen in your life and things don't work out. You think that you got everything planned and next thing you know you run out of money and next thing you know all kinds of stuff happened to you. And you say, why is all this happening? Why? There's an answer. Amen. It's because you would not go the way God wanted you to go. Amen. And so now God has to trouble stuff in your life just so you can crawl your way back to church. That's true. That's true. That's true. And get down on your knees and say, I need God. Yeah. Amen. But you have to be humble. I remember when I first got saved, I didn't care what I learned in the Bible. Whatever I had to change, I was, I was happy to change. Amen. Amen? Right. So, I never want to lose that hunger for God's Word. I'm excited. I want to learn more. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the song. You have to read the chapter before that to understand what he's Amen. talking about. We explained some of that in the, in the previous Bible study about tithes. Talking about the priesthood, the changing of the priesthood, the changing of the law, the taking of tithes, all of that. People today don't want the new covenant. People today don't want the gospel. People today want the law. Amen. They want the Old Testament. Amen. They want it more than they want the gospel. They want Moses more than they want Jesus. Some of them want both. Moses and Jesus at the same time. But Hebrews 8 and 1 says, Now the, thing, now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. The majesty is in the heavens, not on the earth. That's right. Too many people want to build a church on the earth and make it so majestic. Build big buildings. God ain't in none of it. It's all garbage. Amen. It's all trash. Because look at what it says. It says, who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. It says, a minister. Jesus was a minister of the sanctuary. Amen. People today call the buildings here, they call this a sanctuary. Guess what? It's not. It's just the building. That's all it is. But it says that he is a minister of the sanctuary. 
Sanctuary means a place that is set apart. And of the true tabernacle. This is not the tabernacle. There is a real tabernacle and there is a fake one. People say, oh, we're, you know, we're going to the temple, we're going to the tabernacle, we're going to the sanctuary, we're going to the, the, you know, all, whatever they want to call it. But do you think that that's the only place where Jesus is going to dwell? A building on the earth? No, God is too big. He said he's a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched. Did Jesus build this building? Did he, put the, did he put the concrete on the floor and put all the bricks and all the wood? Did he build this? No, he didn't. So this is not the true tabernacle. Any church that was built by a man or a, a place, of, a church building is built by a man, is not good enough for God. Not fit. Not saying that they're wrong, but I'm saying that is not the house of God. That's not the sanctuary. That's not the tabernacle. That's not the holy place. He is the minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Jesus pitched a tabernacle and a sanctuary he built that was not built by man. It says, for every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, where, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. Talking about the Lord. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest. His priesthood was not on the earth. Jesus' priesthood was not earthly. Amen. Amen. That's why he didn't hang out with the high priest, Caiaphas, or Annas. He did not hang out with them because his priesthood was not of the earth. The priesthood on the earth belonged only to the house of Levi. Of the sons of Aaron, not just, not all Levites were priests, but they had to be of the, of the sons of Aaron. There are other families besides Aaron, but they had to come out of his heritage, out of his lineage. Amen. It says, for if he were on earth, he should not have been a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. Amen. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. Do you understand that? Amen. The things that were in the tabernacle and the sanctuary were only shadows. They were only prophecies. They were only patterns. They were only visions. But people are stuck on the, on the, on the shadows, the patterns. And don't know about the true tabernacle. The true sanctuary. It says who served unto the example of the shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God for when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, says he, God, talking about God, that you make all things according to the pattern showed to you in the mount. Do you think Moses just started building stuff? He just started putting things up, building boards and taking skins of... You know, bagging skins and putting all things together and just didn't have a blueprint? Who builds a building and don't know, don't see a pattern before they build it? He didn't just put up something and then God said, I'm going to dwell there. God had to show him a vision. Yeah. Yeah. He had to see a vision from God and whatever he saw in the vision, he had to make sure he built it just like how he saw it. How God showed him. Amen. So the vision was more important than the shadow. The, the, one that he, the thing that he saw from God was what God was intending to be the true tabernacle. The tabernacle on earth was only a shadow. It was only a replica of what was in heaven. But people are stuck on the shadow. I'm going to explain why. Some, uh, some, to some people, they'll say, well, what are you trying to tell me? What are you telling me? I don't understand what you talk about. Well, I'm going to explain all of that. Amen? 
So it says, verse 6, But now he's obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much more also is he a mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Did you hear what the Bible calls the gospel? A better covenant built on better promises. Amen. When it says better, what is it better than? What is the gospel better than? It's better than the old covenant. The gospel is better than the law. Amen. But people don't think that the gospel is better than the law. It said that we are built upon a better covenant with better promises. Amen. That means the gospel, the New Testament, the new covenant is better than the old covenant. Amen. The promises that you get in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you will never find them in the law. Amen. You won't have the, the promise of eternal life in the law. Amen. But you will have the promise of death if you don't keep the law. And not just some of it, but all of it. Amen. People today want to keep only certain parts of the law. They want to keep the Sabbath. They want to keep the meats. They want to keep the tithing. They want to keep this. They want to keep that. But then when it comes to killing animals, they don't want to touch that. The only way that you can please God is by the New Testament, by the gospel. Amen. You cannot reach God by the law. Amen. Nobody that keeps the Sabbath from now until Jesus come is going to get any extra credit points with God. Amen. You sat there and did nothing. Wow. What accomplishment is that? You don't do anything. Amen. God wants you to get up and do something. Amen. God wants you to do righteousness. Amen. And he wants you to rest from sin. That's what God is looking for. So it says, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by which also he is a mediator of a better covenant which is established upon better promises. Go to Exodus chapter 25. Remember it said, see that you build it according to the pattern. Exodus 25 and verse 8. Well, we'll just go. To, we'll start at verse one, so you see who's talking. If it's a man talking, you could you could make up whatever you want. But if it's God, then you need to you need to just shut up and just follow God, God's word. See, verse one says, "And the Lord spoke unto Moses." And if you keep reading all the way down, he's talking the whole time. So whatever God says, you got to do. But when you go down to verse 8, it says, And let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show you after the pattern, the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. People today make tabernacles and sanctuaries, but they make it the way they want. Not the way God wants. People today make churches today where they, you know, that they call sanctuaries. You know, one of the first things they do after they make all the pews and the pulpits, this is not in the Bible. The podium is not in the Bible. Y'all know that? People say this is the pulpit. To people, this is the this is the place of power. This is not a pulpit. Y'all know that? What is a pulpit? That. The stage. A pulpit in the book, in the, I can't remember, I think it was in, in uh, Ezra or Nehemiah. Nehemiah 8. Nehemiah 8, it said that Ezra stood on a pulpit of wood. He didn't stand on this. Above the people. That means he stood up. Not so he can be higher than everybody else, but so his voice would travel. And everybody could see and everybody could hear. Amen. People want to stand up high because they think they're better than somebody else. But they didn't have microphones. That's, right. they didn't, that's why Jesus stood on the mount because his voice traveled. There were no microphones. Amen, bro. But people today, they do that. This is not in the Bible. 
Those pews are not in the Bible. I'm not saying it's wrong. Don't get people say, well, oh, there's no, you know, there's no bathrooms in the Bible. There's no toilets in the bath in the Bible. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that we're so stuck on tradition that we think in order to have a church, you got to have this. You got to have pews. You got to have, you know, a place where, you know, all kinds of stuff. We, we're so caught in the tradition. You know what the only thing that's important in church is? That we're all gathered together in one place. Amen. That's it. Amen. But then people want to build a little place in the front that they call the altar. A lot of people and a lot of preachers do that. They build a place and they call it the altar. That is not the altar. It's tradition. You know where the altar's at? It's in heaven. It's in the same place where the sanctuary is at. You know the only way you can get there? Your mind has to be in heavenly places. That's why sometimes people come and they come to these churches and they have these services and they all say, all right, let's call people to the altar. Let's come, let's all come to the altar. People's bodies just drag and come up to the front like a bunch of zombies. <laughs> They don't, even, they don't even connect with God. They just go up there and say, pray for man. What do you want me to pray for? Just pray for me. Stick your little hands up in the air. Don't even, don't even ask for nothing. Don't want nothing. You can't even think of anything. You can't even say, pray for me that I get the Spirit of God. Pray for me that God fill me. Pray for me that God bless me. Pray for my mind. He was just, man, pray for me. If you don't want to be, see, you don't have to tell everybody your prayer request, but just tell, you know, people come all the time, they come out of routine. Let's call, anybody want to come to the altar? Everybody come up there, people start crying. Same people crying all the time. People just finished preaching the gospel. They get up, they say, they see nobody else coming, they come up, <laughs> putting on a show. Just a show. That's not the altar. You can come up to the front all you want, but if your mind is not in heavenly places, it won't profit you nothing. Pray for people, nothing happens, and they blame us. Man, you're supposed to be the pastor, and something wrong with you. You getting up there preaching, talking about everybody else. We ain't even talking about everybody else. All we do is preach what the, what's in the Word. Amen. If it hits our toes, it hits our toes too. Come to the altar. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but that is not in the Bible. Amen. Where in the Bible did you ever find the Apostle Peter talk about, now let's come to the altar. Let's do an altar call. Where did Paul preach an altar call? Nowhere. They preached the gospel and people were running to them. They preached the gospel and before they could even finish preaching the gospel, people were already speaking in tongues. Yes, sir. It said in the book of Acts chapter 10, while Peter yet was yet preaching the word, he wasn't even finished. God fell on them and they started speaking tongues. And there was no altar call. You can hear the word right now. God can fall on you and I don't mind if God interrupts the service. But a lot of preachers, no, no, no. Tell that, go get the deacons. Go get the deacons. Tell them, to, tell them to be quiet. Hold themselves. Wait for the altar call. No. We're moving with the Spirit of God. Amen. We don't need to, you don't need to wait to the end of service to feel the move of God. Amen. If you come here for prayer, you should be feeling God already. Amen. And then when we sing songs, you can still feel God. Yeah. And when you hear the word preach, if it does anything to you, if the truth moves you, you should get up out of your seat. Don't just dance for a keyboard. Don't dance for a beat of a drum. You start dancing and start doing all kinds of stuff. No, when you hear the truth, it should make you rejoice. Amen. Church just becomes all hype in a lot of places. Routine. I, I heard a preacher one time, Pentecostal preacher, talk about he still he knows how to preach the gospel, but he's still trying to learn how to do an altar call. 
He still can't. He said he could do the preaching part easy, but he don't know how to do a good altar call. And I'm telling you this because I'm a minister, and I'm going to tell you the stuff that I've heard other ministers say. You know what he said? Another minister told him about how to do an altar call, how he has to do it in order to do it right. He said, if you want to do it, there's a minister told him, another minister, how to do an altar call. He said, you got to think of it like this. You got to think of the altar call like you're trying to get a woman ready for bed. You got to get them in the mood. That's what he said. What kind of garbage is that? Preachers, they want to get their altar calls like a man trying to get the woman in the mood. Some of y'all look at straight face and going like that. So that, that means y'all know what I mean. I don't need to make it any more plainer than that. Amen. Amen. We don't need that stuff here. Amen, if you want to feel God, feel God now. Amen. Right now. You don't have to wait. Amen. I'm telling you, when Paul would baptize people in Acts chapter 19, he baptized them, he laid his hands on them, they began to speak in other tongues. That's right. He didn't need to, he didn't need to shake them on their back and start shaking their head, Amen. slapping them around. That's right. No one needs to get you all pumped and primed up to speak in tongues. Amen. Amen. Man, I'm telling you, God, the Spirit of God fell on Cornelius and his house and nobody even put no hands on them. But then in Acts chapter 19, the apostles put their hands on them and then God moved. Amen. You gotta, you gotta, God should be able to move on you even when nobody lays hands on you. Amen. Amen. True. True. That's right. But if you're having problems trying to reach God, you might need a man of God to lay his hands on you and then you could get in the Spirit. Amen. Make sure that you build it according to the pattern that was shown you on the mount. Look at verse, this is 25 and verse 40. Well, actually, yeah, verse 40. It says, and look that you make them after the pattern which was shown to you in the mount. Pattern. See, everything that Moses built was shown to him. What was shown to him was the New Testament. Was the sanctuary in heaven. He built something that was Old Testament. Something that was only temporary. But what was in heaven, the, path, the thing that God showed him was forever. Look at Numbers chapter 8, Numbers 8 and verse 4. This should be interesting. Numbers chapter 8 and verse 4. It says... And this work of the candlestick was a beaten goal unto the shaft thereof, unto the flowers thereof, was beaten work according to the pattern which the Lord had showed Moses, so he made the candlestick. You see that? You know what the candlestick is? You ever seen a little candlestick that's got seven, seven branches? It's got one candlestick and it's got three coming in both, in both sides. Yeah. And these, pe- these preachers want to get it all into the law and they get a little candlestick and they got, they got a little six-pointed star in the middle of it and they got the candles with wax candles. All of that is garbage because that's not the pattern that God showed Moses. All these people got these little menorahs, these candlesticks, and it's too smooth. Smooth candlesticks. The Bible says it's supposed to be done with beaten work. It had to be beaten. It did not look smooth. It had to, it would look all rugged. It had flowers. It had almonds. And there only had to be seven candlesticks. 
People get these candlesticks that got nine, that's garbage. There's supposed to be one in the middle, three out of this side, three out of that side. That makes seven. That's why when you read the book of Revelation, it says the seven golden candlesticks. It didn't say the nine golden candlesticks. It didn't say the nine silver candlesticks. It didn't say the seven silver go uh, candlesticks. It has to be made of pure gold. People say, oh, why, why make a big deal about it? Revelation chapter 1. It's a mystery. That's right. Revelation chapter 1 might not mean much to you because you don't really know what you're in. But it means a lot to me. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 12. I turned to see the voice that spoke with me and being turned I saw seven golden candlesticks, the same ones that we were reading about in Exodus. Or by the numbers. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire. If you think that this is a picture of what Jesus is supposed to look like hanging on your wall, think again. Take it off. This is, not, this is not showing ethnicity. Amen. This is not showing nationality. Amen. It's not showing race. Right. Because when have you ever saw somebody with a white head and a different color body? Maybe if they got burned, but ain't nobody come out with a white head and white hair and a different color body. Because it's not focusing on nationality, it's focusing on his characteristics. Right. When have you ever saw somebody whose eyes were as a flame of fire? Never! It's showing that there's, he's not playing around. He's not happy. He's angry. It said, his eyes were as a flame of fire, his feet like a fine brass as they, they have been burned, and his voice was the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. See, he didn't have a real knife coming out of his mouth. And in his hand, his right hand, he had the seven stars. In his right hand, in his power, in his authority. And a sharp sword came out of his mouth. Two edges. That means it'll cut you both ways. It'll cut the men. It'll cut the women. It'll cut the, the old. It'll cut the young. It'll cut the preachers. It'll cut the congregation. It'll cut the deacons. It'll cut the bishops. It'll cut the musicians. It'll cut the people who sing. There's no getting around it. A lot of times we just try to look at it one way. It'll cut the lost and it'll cut the saved. It could cut us too. A sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. You never saw anything as bright as that. But it says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. That's serious. Some of y'all won't even fall on your knees for nothing. Some of y'all you care too much about your pants. You care too much about your shoes. You care too much about your clothes. You care too much about your reputation. You don't want to bend your knees because you're too ashamed to bend your knees. Amen. When John saw Jesus, he fell down as dead. You think you're going to go to heaven and you're going to say, Oh, hi Jesus. How you doing? Hey Lord. Praise Lord. God bless you. Thank you. Sorry little Christianity is going to go right into the lake of fire. No, when you see Jesus, you better hit the ground. Amen. And when you see Him, His presence is so powerful, you're not, you don't even have to, no one has to tell you to hit the ground. Right. You are going to fall as if you were dead. 
But some people, ah, whatever. I'll oh, trust me. Those that are full of pride, he's going to break everything down. In the day of the Lord, when he's coming back to judge the wicked, no one's going to hide. You know what the strength of the wicked is? Pride. Rebellion. But when Jesus comes back, there's no strength for the wicked. Rebellion won't hide you from God. Wickedness, pride will not hide you from God. He will burn right through you. You, you think people, you know, they, when they see somebody's knees start to knock, you're not even going to have time for your knees to knock. Because he's going to destroy you. He says, when I saw him, I felt his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, fear not, I am the first and the last. That's who's talking here. The Jehovah Witness say, no, that's Jehovah. Because if you read in Isaiah 44 and 6, he says, I am the first, I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. But people say, no, Jehovah is the only first and the last. Here it says, fear not, I'm the first and the last. So you ask the Jehovah Witnesses, is that talking about, is that talking about Jesus or is that talking about Jehovah? Jehovah. Nowadays you can't even ask apostolics that question. Okay, because the next verse will show you who is talking. Amen. Isaiah 44 and 6. It says that the Lord said, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. But now in verse 18, it says, I am he that liveth. I'm he that lives and was dead. When did God die? Never. God never died. The body of the Messiah died. The man Christ Jesus. God is eternal. God can never die. If God dies, this, then he's not eternal. There's no space in existence where God was not alive. Death is the time where life ceases. God cannot die. That's why God manifested himself in the flesh. And he himself, the almighty God, got inside that body. And that body was able to taste death for us. Amen. It was not another person inside Jesus. It was God himself. But people won't tell you that. It was the father that was inside the body of Jesus Christ. So he says, I am he that liveth and was dead. Jesus was the only one that died. Amen. Jesus said he's the first and the last. Isaiah 44 and 6 says that the Lord said he's the first and the last. Amen. And beside him there is no God. Amen. But yet people want to say Jesus is not God. It's because they don't understand who God is. So it says, I was he that was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. See, Jesus said amen. That means you can't fight it. Amen. It doesn't matter what the preachers say today. People say Jesus is not God, but when he said, I am he that was alive and was dead, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. It doesn't matter what no one else says. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write these things which you have seen. And the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. Now watch this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand. The set, it says, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Amen. The messengers. You know that the churches, all the churches have angels. Amen. You just don't see them. That's right. There are angels here right now, you just don't see them. Some of y'all messing around, doing all kinds of crazy stuff during church. All kinds of stuff running through your mind. The angels see everything. Yeah. But there's an angel over the church. God has made us, even, even us ministers, as, as angels of this earth. 
The word angel means messenger. There are angels which are in heaven and there are angels which are on the earth. But you know about the angels of the churches have to be in his right hand. The ministry has to be in the right hand of Jesus. There are a lot of preachers today that are not in the right hand of Jesus. They are doing their own thing. That's why preachers today fight against each other all the time. Beating up their fellow servants. While the Lord tarried, they began to smite their fellow servants. And they get drunk with the wicked and say, our Lord delays his coming. But guess what? When the Lord comes, He's going to cut all these preachers that start to fight against each other, beating their fellow servants. God did not even call us to beat up on God's people. Amen. That's not what ministry is for, to beat up on God's people. The ministry is to edify, to build up the church, Amen. to strengthen you so you can be able to stand. Right. The ministry of every church that is of God has to be in the right hand of Jesus. Amen. If we hop out of that hand, man, people got big organizations and all that stuff and they're still going to hell. What hand would you want to be in? The right hand or the left hand? A lot of churches are in the left hand. You read Matthew chapter 25, he had the, he had the, the sheep on the right hand, he had the goats on the left. And he's going to divide at the resurrection. With the first resurrection, only the sheep are coming up. At the left, which is the, res the second resurrection, that's when all the goats are going to rise up. See, all, in, the, in the first resurrection, all the true churches and the true people of God are going to rise. At the second resurrection, you're going to find all these denominations. You're going to find the Baptist. You're going to find the Lutheran. You're going to find the Catholic. You're going to find a lot of apostolics. You're going to find the Pentecostals. You're going to find the non-denominationals. If... The people don't stay in the right hand of God, we're not going to make it. Because whatever, if, you, if, you're, if the angels or the ministers of the churches are in the right hand of God, that means that Jesus is in control. Not me. Not pastor. Jesus has to be in control. When Jesus is in control, that means even us ministers got to be careful what we preach. Amen. Because if we preach something false, we need to be humble enough to come back and tell you we're sorry because we repent. We had it wrong. You won't hear a lot of ministers doing that today. Got to be careful what we teach. Amen. And it said, the seven candlesticks which you saw are the seven churches. Now why did I even go there? What did it say in Numbers that the candlesticks have to be made out of? Gold? Gold? Beaten work. If you're the true church, you got to be beaten. Not by us. You got to go through persecution. You got to go through tribulation. You got to be tried. People want these churches to look nice, have all these programs, have a little daycare for the children, have all kinds of stuff, auxiliaries for the women, have, you know, little get togethers for the men Not, those things ain't wrong but what I'm saying is people want that but they don't want they don't want they don't want a church that's going to have to go through persecution as soon as something wrong happens in the church people just dip out Amen. take off leave Man, I don't like the way this person sings I don't like the way this person prays I don't like the way this preacher preaches and all of these people got problems. And then something goes wrong. Pew! Take off, leave. You know what? People want a church that is smooth. They don't want a church that is a beaten work. A true church is not a church without problems. People say, oh, there's no perfect church. Yes, there is. Jesus is coming back for a church that is a glorious church without spot and without wrinkle. Amen. But guess what? That's going to take some work. That means there has to be wrinkles first in order for it to be ironed out. There has to be spots 
for it to be clean. Or any such thing. But any church that claims that there's no problems is nothing but a fake church. If you go to church and all you do is hear, God's got a blessing for you, God's got a blessing for you, and there's no changes, nothing troubles you. That's not a church of God. God's true church is going to iron out all the wrinkles. God's true church, His true ministers are going to trouble you and, call, and, and encourage you to change. But everyone wants a church that has no problems. You, you can search the whole world, you will never find it. Amen. Some people try to go Catholic because, you know, the Catholics, they, they don't really do much. They just go there, they go to the service, and then they in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. This is the word of the Lord. You think you, could, you think go to a Catholic church is because you don't want nobody to bother you? Then why did this Catholic priest start bothering with little, little boys' backsides? Why do they, why do they got these, these nuns in the convent and start chaining them up and start doing nasty stuff with them? So you could try to go to be, to be a Catholic because you think no one will bother you, but guess what? They'll still bother you there. You could become a Baptist. And you think that no one's going to bother you and that anything that you believe is okay. And nothing is wrong. Because the Bible is open for interpretation. Those same people that go to the Baptist church will still mess with you. Because they believe that once you're saved, you're always saved. Which is another lie. Amen. Once you're saved, you're always saved. It doesn't matter what you do, God will forgive you. No, there are some things that you can do that God will not forgive you for. God is merciful, but God does not want no one to play with Him. Yeah. You can't premeditate sin and say, Oh, I'm going to go ahead and do it, but then I'll just ask God to forgive me. Yeah. God heard you before you did it. Amen. Because in, in that one time, people who use people in the Bible like King David, and he did something wrong, and then he, and then he got himself right with God. And they'll say, Well, I'll just do like David. You ain't David. You might be a salt. Saul did something wrong, and God cut him off. He didn't cut him off immediately, but Saul's life was miserable. He had a good, he started off right, humble, seeking God. But then he got to the point, he couldn't hear from God no more. The Spirit of God left him, and a spirit, an evil spirit came to him. He could not even hear from God. He couldn't have no more dreams. God wouldn't talk to him in dreams. God wanted to talk to him in visions. The prophets no longer wanted to tell him what, what thus saith the Lord. So Saul had to sneak and go to some, you know, go to some witches to try to get consulted the familiar spirits and say, he tried to hide himself and went to a witch, went to a psychic and say, consult somebody for me. And then, and who is it? One you know, this name Samuel. And then when she consults him, because all that stuff people think, you know, you want to mess with magic, you want to mess with voodoo and all that stuff, and people think that doesn't have powers, it does. But it's not of God. But you don't want to get into voodoo and magic and witch doctors and Ouija boards and all that nonsense. That's why you got to watch, you know, be careful what kind of stuff that you entertain yourself, movies and all kinds of stuff like that. You want, to, you want to invite some spirits in your house? Start entertaining that, that garbage. But when he went and he disguised himself, and when Samuel was raised up, that woman said, you see me, you're soft. You're soft. People will look at you. You say you go to church, you start getting all top magic stuff, and you, know, you want to see people that died in the past. And they say, oh, aren't you that one that goes to church? They're going to call you out. Saul could not hear from God no more. Saul couldn't hear from God so much that when he called a witch to, to try to hear from Samuel, Samuel still prophesied against him. Still prophesied against him from a witch. He said, why are you with me? Why you, God's not speaking to you no more. And then he still prophesied to him. He said, this day 
You're going to be with me. Don't think that once you're saved, you're always saved. And you can do anything and just say, God, forgive me. God forgives those who really mean it. Who really, really mean it. But the seven golden candlesticks, the churches are made of beat and work. There's no such thing as a church without problems. Every church is going to have problems somewhere. The thing that has to happen is that we got to just handle the problems right. We got to do it the right way. We got to forgive the right way. We got to reconcile the right way. Because I'm telling you, there's so many, there's so many churches, people, churches split every day. There's churches that happen that new denominations are created because somebody got mad at somebody else, and then there's a new church. A new ministry. But I'm telling you, God's church is not divided like that. You see the golden candlesticks? There's one in the middle, three coming out this way, three coming out another way. And in here he said, these are the seven churches of Asia, Philadelphia. You know, he talks about Smyrna, Pergamos, all of those. But they are all branches. The churches are supposed to be connected together, Amen. not divided. Right. Somebody wants to start an organization over here. Another one wants to start an organization over there. We don't need that. Amen. We don't need these organizations. We need the churches to be connected together. Right. Too many people don't want that. I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not a minister that believes... And being lords over God's heritage. We want to see people get saved and we want to, we want to raise up some men that will, be, that will carry the ministry on and spread out. And after they spread out, we're still connected. Amen. We're still working together. But every day, church is split. Amen. Make sure that, you, that you, you said that you build it after the pattern that's in the mount. One last... A uh, place I'm going to go to is Hebrews chapter 13. Talking again about that altar. Say, so thank God for the visitor who came in. Amen. You're welcome here. Amen. So Hebrews 13 and uh, verse 9. People come to church. And they just want to hear the words faith, love, Christ. They just want it, Jesus, God, that's all they want to hear. But as soon as you say the D word, I'm not talking about the curse word, the word doctrine. They don't want to hear the word doctrine. I'm not talking about a curse word. But people today don't want to hear the word doctrine. Because doctrine is too controversial for everybody because people don't want you to rub them the wrong way. Everyone is too afraid to talk about doctrine because people get too touchy. So in, in order to stay away from the doctrine, let's just talk about sin in general. Let's just talk about faith in general. Let's just talk about love. Let's just talk about Jesus. Let's just talk about heaven. Don't talk about hell. But when it comes to doctrine... People just want, they think anything you believe is right. That's wrong. Hebrews 13 and verse 9, it says, Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. There are strange doctrines out there. Amen. That's why you got to study your Bible. Amen. If you don't have a Bible when you come to church, the preacher can tell you, Give me all your money. And you'll do it. The preacher will take all the money out of your wallet. He'll take your light bill money. He'll take your rent. He'll take the money that you're going to put to put gas into your car. Because people don't know what the word says. It says, be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, with favor, not with meats, 
which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. You see that? People today want to keep the law of Moses. If you have dinner or you go out to eat, they're always, their eyeballs tend to look right at your plate. So, so brother, what, what you got on your pizza? What is that? Is that, is that chicken or is that bacon? They want to know what's on your plate. Because they want to keep the law. Amen. Man, just let me eat my bacon in peace. Amen. Let me eat my pepperoni. Can't eat certain things around people today because they want to be, they want to be so into the law. Right. I have gotten mature enough that if, somebody, if something offends somebody, I, I won't do it. Right. But only because I love them and because I want to gain them. But as soon as you get the revelation, man, I'm going to eat, I'm going to eat bacon like crazy in front of you. Amen? Bacon tastes good. I'm not going to eat so much that, it's gonna, that I'm going to get sick because you can stay away from it for health reasons. But you just cannot say it's a sin. You can't make a doctrine and say if you eat pork, you're going to hell because that's a lie. First, uh, First Timothy chapter 4 says that, you know, for it should come to pass in the latter days that many people come up with strange doctrines, seducing spirits, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding men to marry and to eat meats that were, you know, God created. But it says, and not with meats, the heart needs to be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Now watch this, verse 10. We have an altar... Whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. In the tabernacle, when they had the tabernacle, there was actually two altars. Did you know that? Can anybody name those two? It's just, if you know it. Okay, one of them was sacrifice. The washing was labor. Good, you know. Anybody else want to give a shot? That's good. Albert? Huh? The Lord? <laughs> That's good. Good try. Anybody else? She said sacrifice, so we got that one out of the way, so there's only one left. Anybody know what the other altar was? Anybody? Come on. Even if it's the wrong answer. Huh? He got he got the revelation part of it. Another revelation part of it. Was that? You got the revelation of the of the sacrifice. Altar of incense. You all know that. When when they had the tabernacle, there was a gate that surrounded the tabernacle. There was a building that was called the sanctuary. In between the sanctuary and the gate was a laver where the priest watched. So it was like, you know, say that's that's the uh, the, the sanctuary. When you go into the gate, there was only one way to get in. There was not two doors in the the, the, the tabernacle. There was only one gate, one door. You came in, the first thing you came to was the altar of uh, the brazen altar where they sacrificed animals. So they had to sacrifice, something had to die first before you did anything. You can't just go all the way to the sanctuary and you didn't kill it, if an animal did not, a sacrifice. If you, if you skip the altar, the brazen altar to sacrifice, you were no good. God could actually destroy you if you wanted to. So they had to come sacrifice the animal, then after that they had to labor when they would watch. The priest would watch and they would make sure that they would clean, wash their feet and all the stuff when they sacrificed. And they would go into the sanctuary, or when they went in, there was a table of showbread on the right, and there was, there was a golden candlestick on the left. The priests had to make sure that they lit the candlesticks and it stayed lit continually. It was not allowed to go out. It didn't have a wax candle. Like I said earlier, it's out of beating work, there was no wax. Churches today are wax churches. They burn up so easily, that's why they fade away. But when the church is made of pure gold, it can withstand persecution troubles. 
So they lit the candlestick and it brought light to the room where they could eat the showbread in the light. And the showbread was, was only seen when they light the candlestick. After that, there was an altar, a smaller altar called the altar of incense, where they would take incense and they would burn incense on the altar and it was sent to God. It was a type of prayer. That's why it said, you know, Brother Will and uh, somebody else said, you know, worship prayers for the Andre. That's what the incense of the altar of incense represented the prayers of the saints. And once you did that, you went through the veil, and the veil behind it was the was the holy place, which people call the holy of holies. And that's where the that's where that had the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. Inside of it was the Ten Commandments, the 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 Omer of bread, and then it had the rod of Aaron that budded. But all of that, there was two altars. In the sanctuary, the altar of incense was inside the temple. What's the temple now? You. You're the temple. The altar of incense is in you. It's not in a, it's not in a physical location in a building. Some people feel like they can't pray until they come here. Oh no. If this is the only place you pray, then you do make this place, you know, this is, you're actually making this place the temple of God, and it's not. You've got to be able to reach God at home. Amen. If you're in an accident or about to get an accident, you need to reach God there. Amen. You need to find the altar Amen. when you're in your car, Amen. when you're on your way to work, Amen. when you're on your way home. When somebody says, I need somebody to pray, you need to be able to find the altar of incense, which is the prayers of the saints, Amen. wherever you're at. That's right. That's right. But people today, they make these buildings, they put a big old bench in the front, a backless bench, and they call that the altar. I know a pastor, he, he had, he had a, a church building, and the hurricane came and actually broke down the roof and flooded and flooded the whole building and the carpet was messed up, the pews were torn up and then the little, the little thing that they called an altar was tore up. He said, man, this hurricane destroyed our altar. I said, no it didn't. I said, he said, man, our church is destroyed. I said, the building's destroyed but the church is not destroyed. He said, we got no power. I said, the building don't got power but the church still has power. Amen. <laughs> If a hurricane will take the electricity out of your building and you say the church does not have power, what a sad testimony. Amen. Uh, a hurricane could come, God, God forbid, but a hurricane could come right now. If it turns off electricity, the, the church better still have power. Amen. The altar is not over here. The altar is supposed to be in you. Right. Amen. If, if, a, if a physical piece of furniture gets destroyed and now you can't pray, that, that is a shame. It says, we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. That means the priests, they can't eat off our altar. You know what, we have the same altar that Abraham had. You know what altar he had? Because they used to offer up animals. He built an altar and he, and he started to call in the name of the Lord. Amen. There, was no, there was no animal sacrifice. His sacrifice was his, was his worship. His sacrifice was his prayers. Psalm 141 says, let the lifting up of my hands, you know, let, let my prayer be set before you as incense and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Amen. That's what God is requiring. Right. Amen. Amen. We are supposed to be of the true tabernacle, the true sanctuary. That's right. We've got to make sure that we have it built according to the pattern which God showed Moses on the mount. Amen? Give me Bible radio.